than we did in a lifetime 500 years ago. Do you know how much work that is to process? Things won't get easier just by clinging to what we have. <laughs> you think you're so smart. And you're just scared. Yes, scared that we're wasting our time. What happened to the guy who stuck his neck out of the cave or put his boots on the moon? I'm instinct, not a romantic thought. I fight when we are attacked. And who survives? The one who adapts? Or the one who never changes? How many kisses do I get? We've been here before. Trust me. If I do, can we meet halfway? I think you know. in this video, change is coming and we should be prepared to accept it and not be afraid of it. During these two months, we've been visiting all the schools in our country. We've been in Elbasan, Bej, Sarik, Peshin and all the way. And we have talked with teachers, professors, students. And what we have concluded from all these visits as is that there are a lot of challenges that we are facing all today. Sorry, my emotion. <laughs> so, the challenges that schools and universities are facing today are the lack of practical experience, the dual system, study and work, so we should, uh, should have more potential on this, not enough support for future orientation, missing resources, and no break between bachelor and master degrees. And the, lack, the, the challenges that the business is facing is also the lack of practical experience, insecurities of, of students, and the brain drain. We all know the brain drain students are living today. And the goal, our goal is to adopt the German dual study model, so study and work to have our students here and not leaving the country, giving them the, the opportunities they have abroad and have them all them here. And how can we do that step by step? So we should understand, communicate, empower, make synergies and make plans. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valbona. Is there uh, time now for any comments or questions in the audience? So far? Not. So we are really good in time, and uh, maybe that's the uh, opportunity I, I, I can take uh, for, for another thought. What was education in the former times? Uh, you went to school, to university, and you had a textbook, and you learned it by heart, and uh, the examination was to reproduce what the textbook said. And uh, in, in a lot of countries in the world, uh, especially in Asia, I think, that is still how it's done. But how can we test knowledge for the challenges of the future? I don't think the textbook with answers and with proven solutions is uh, of any help. We talk about change, of course, the young people don't uh, really notice the change. They, you you want into what, what is a fact now. If, if I have a problem with my iPhone, I ask a five-year-old boy or girl, or probably girl even knows better about it. For the elder people, uh, change means a lot of effort. 
And so the youth conference really is not only to address youth, but also to address the older generation. And if the older generation doesn't take part and support the change, I think it will be very hard or impossible for the youth to succeed. So the older generation starting with parents, but also of course professors, politicians, administrators, journalists, whoever it is, has to has to encourage young people to say, well, well, we have our needs and we'll do it differently. And we, your textbooks are, are really not our solution. So I think the, the new world, the new learning is, uh, is to, to test out things. Because of course, you as the youth, you don't have a crystal ball and no, you don't know the future. So how, how, how to prepare? To prepare is of course to get knowledge, to get skills. Uh, to get the academic side, but also the practical side in business, because uh, if uh, whatever is uh, uh, acquired and knowledge doesn't work, at least not in the, in the business sense and doesn't make money, uh, it, it will not succeed. A different thing, of course, is uh, um, at universities where you do research and uh, don't apply it to the business world right, right away. But anyway, you have to formulate your requests, your demands. The hero of my youth was Bob Dylan. You all know the song, uh, Times Are Changing. And that wasn't back 50 years, it's all the time. One of the famous lines he said is, if you can't lend a hand, then step aside. And of course, the older generation, we don't want to step aside. We want to lend a hand, and we have to understand it. We have to be good-willed, and we have to support the young people also in when they uh, go ways which we don't understand. And that actually is what the next speaker is talking about. He's not talking about the shortest way from A to B, but uh, he's talking about also the charm of a detour. And sometimes it takes a little bit to, to arrive where you maybe don't even know you want to go. Um, very, very complicated uh, uh, thing, but yes, you have to have the motivation and uh, you, you have to be willing to learn, be flexible, adapt, know other cultures, find yourself and have a goal. And what Simon Reuter, from Germany is uh, talking about is exactly not all those who wander are lost. How to turn your passions into career and uh, what is he? What is his title? Uh, he calls himself a futurist globetrotter. So let's see what he has to say. Simon. Okay, now just for the record, I don't call myself that, Elvis calls me that. <laughs> All right, now who am I? I am not a superstar. I'm not famous. I'm not a particularly successful businessman, nor have I made any great innovations. My name will probably never make it into the history books. Now you've all signed up for this conference and you've promised inspirational speakers, extraordinary people who've achieved great things and who will now share their wisdom with you. So what the hell am I doing up here? Well, it's quite simple really, because while I may have not achieved anything newsworthy, there's something else about me that as I keep learning is surprisingly rare in this world that we live in today. And that is, I love what I do. A lot of work. When I wake up in the morning, I look forward to the day, most of the days at least. When I go to work, I don't dread it. And many times I can't think of anything that I'd rather be doing at that specific time. Now that hasn't always been the case for me. Actually there were times in my <laughs> young life where it was quite the opposite. And it turns out that that appears to be true for many people. In 2017, Worldwide Gallup poll found out that as little as 15% of the world's 1 billion full-time employees feel engaged at their workplace. 
meaning a staggering 85% of people either feel no passion for their job or they outright hate their work. They hate their job. Okay, now I mean, everybody hates their job, right? Why does that match so much? Let's do the math here. Let's say you're 21 years old and you start your first full-time position. You will probably work until you retire by the age of 67. That is 46 years. You work 40 hours a week, plus an additional hour of lunch break every day that you spend at or close to the office, 60 minutes for the commute to work and back home every day, and let's add another hour for the occasional extra time, the time that you spend getting ready for work, phone calls for work that you take at home, work messages, you know, all that little extra stuff that's happened. A week has 168 hours, of which you spend an average of 56 asleep. That is, that leaves you with 112 hours. So, out of those remaining 112 hours that you spend awake every week, you spend at least 55 hours exclusively dedicated to your work. So if you hate your job, you're going to spend at least half your time for the next 46 years being unhappy. Okay, now you may want to say, all right, that's just the way it is. I mean, jobs need to be done. Not everybody can have a perfect job. I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, you've, got to, you've got to work through it. See the right side. That's a huge problem, though, and I'll show you why. Studies have shown that people who are happy at their workplace, who enjoy what they're doing, are up to 20% productive. They sell up to 37% more products. They are more loyal to the company, and they have much better health, resulting in fewer days of sick leave. So technically, it should be in every company's best interest to keep you happy, to make sure that you enjoy your work. And honestly, more and more companies have heard the call, and they do a lot to keep their employees happy. Let's take Google instance. Google at Silicon Valley. People who work for Google. They get to work out at the company, what's that, company gym, company fitness center. They get to have free massages at the spa and wellness center. They get free food and beverages, even beer and wine, free. All of that for free. And they get to play around with all these new technology, all these new devices for free. All of that during workouts. Now that sounds like the perfect job, right? Playing video games at work. Yet there are still people who work for companies even like Google and they still don't enjoy what they're doing and they still not be at their job. And that might just be because they're doing the wrong thing. Because they're not doing the things that they would enjoy doing, the things that would make them happy. Now my very own personal story sort of revolves around that same issue. Meet Simon, age 18. I was a dorky, small-town kid from rural Germany about to graduate from high school. I was a bit of a troublemaker, a bit of a nerd at the same time. I wasn't exactly a high achiever, but I was kind of a wide achiever, meaning I was kind of good at a lot of things. Not particularly good at one thing, but pretty good at quite a few things. So people naturally assumed that I had a bright future ahead of me. I grew a lot of privilege, wide, middle-class family, caring, open-minded parents who would try out a lot of things and who would always support me when I came around with a new fancy or something that I found interesting. And there were so many things that I found interesting. I was into music, playing in different local bands. I loved theatre and even performed on stage. There should be a picture of me killing someone on stage. <laughs> yes, I was into theatre. I loved reading and writing and I was really good with... What's, what's with the presentation, guys? Okay, well anyway, so I was also into reading and writing, I was good with words, I freelanced for a local newspaper for a while and actually made a little bit of money while I was still at school writing articles. I got into photography and most of all, I had an intense passion for being outdoors, for being in the mountains, to hike, to climb, to ski. I grew up climbing mountains with my dad and I really loved that, I loved being outdoors. And as I said, I was good with things, you know, people came to my show, they wanted to see me perform. And, yeah, there were so many things I was interested in, but when high school came to an end, I was faced with a reality that really shook me, and it shook me profoundly. I had absolutely no clue what to do with math. My friends from high school, they went on to university to study. They became doctors and lawyers and businessmen. Others were left behind, like me, hanging around, not quite knowing what to do. And honestly, that 
put me into a bit of a crisis. Because here was I, somebody who'd always had it quite easy at life, you know, to whom many doors stood wide open, to whom things came naturally, who grew up with so much privilege, and I was interested in so many things, yet I had absolutely no clue what to do with my life. Now at the time, boys in Germany were still forced to do a military service. And uh, if you didn't fancy playing with guns, you could do a community service instead. I was a pacifist, so that's what I did. And in the situation of ISIS, I decided to go as far away as I possibly could, to a remote island in the North Sea. That's the remote island in the North Sea. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> Guys, do we, do we have images, or is that just not happening today? No? It's just not happening today? Okay. Well, anyway, imagine a rural island, a remote island in the North Sea. So, I had to go to this remote island, which was very far away from my home place. I grew up in the south of Germany. This island is in the north of Germany. It's about a thousand kilometers away, the furthest possible distance within the borders of Germany. And so I hopped on my scooter, which was like this old motor scooter that goes as fast as 40 kilometers per hour, and I rode that thing for two weeks all the way across Germany. And on that trip, I realized another thing. I loved traveling. I hadn't done much traveling before, let alone traveled on my own. But going all these places, seeing all these new things, meeting all these new people, that fascinated me. And when I finally made it to that, oh, that's the island. <laughs> Check out the island. Let's see what else is happening. What else do we have? Nothing. Yeah, okay, that's me on the island. So when I finally made it to that island, I had signed to work in a community-based youth hostel for a year. You know, cleaning rooms, making beds, making food for the guests, working with tourists also. I guided them around the island, I created experiences for them. And I realized another thing. I love working with tourists. Because when I couldn't go travel myself, at least I could be part of their experience. But when this year came to an end, I was faced with the same problem as a year before. I had to decide what I wanted to do with my life. Now you remember what I was good at, right? Now I was even able to, to add two more things to that list. Traveling and tourism. But looking at this list, none of these things actually says, I'm a job. I mean, music in itself, that is not a career. And sure enough, traveling isn't. So here I was one year later, and I still had absolutely no clue. Now, I should have probably sat down and try and solve that problem then. Just make a list or something and like, you know, think of something. Find a career that I can take. Or I could run away again, which is kind of what I did. I signed up for a volunteer program and went to South Africa for a year to work in a small community-based primary school in the slums of Cape Town. It was an intense time full of interesting experiences, quite a few borderline experiences, to be honest, and also some absolutely incredible travel stories. Yet, when that year came to an end, and I had to make this decision again, and decide what I wanted to do, I had kind of thought that this sort of experience, you know, going to Africa for a year, working in a school, experiencing all these new places, that would sort of open my mind, it would open my eyes and show me the path that I was supposed to take in life. But a year later, I realized that I still had absolutely no clue what to do with my life. Now, what did I do in that situation? Honestly, I kind of ran away again. I did enroll in university, but I studied American English and media studies, which are two subjects in the arts that are very interesting, you can learn a lot of interesting things, but they do not exactly prepare you for any kind of job. It's just something that you study because it's interesting, but it's not taking you anywhere career-wise. And, I mean, I did enjoy going to school. I learned a lot of things, I started questioning a lot of my beliefs, a lot of my... my well, I just started questioning my position in society, really, in the world. Um, and most importantly, it left me the time to do the two things that I enjoyed most in the world. To travel and to climb mountains. And I traveled a lot. There should be a lot of traveling pictures out there now, because I, I, I traveled a lot. I went to Southeast Asia and backpacked for a while. I went to North America and cycled through the States. Um, I went to Northern and Eastern Africa, traveled there, worked in community projects. 
I went to Chile, South America, to climb some of the highest mountains in the world. And whenever I got a chance, I went outdoors. I went to the mountains to hike, to climb, to camp out in the wilderness. And in order to be able to afford doing that, I worked part-time during my job studies. I had all sorts of different jobs. Some of them were actually really, really terrible. But eventually I found one that I kind of liked, which was at a youth hostel in Berlin, where I worked with tourists and in marketing. And as I said, it was a good time. I mean, I traveled, I studied, I did that for five years. But after a while, it turned out that I was rushing head on to a full-blown crisis. Because here was I, five years later, I was in my mid-twenties now. I had traveled the world, I had studied at university, I had done and seen so many things. Yet I still couldn't figure out what I actually wanted to do in life. Damn it. There were so many funny pictures there. Um, yeah. And it, the problem was not that I couldn't see myself doing a specific kind of job. I imagined a lot of things. I imagined myself being a writer, someone who makes a living with his words, maybe a journalist. I thought of myself as a musician and an actor, you know, touring the world on stage. I don't know, maybe play the big halls. You know, that kind of stuff. But also more established jobs. I thought about becoming a lawyer, you know, or a doctor or maybe a politician, or, I don't know, in my family pretty much everyone was a teacher, so naturally I considered that too, but none of these things felt quite right, because they would cater to one or two of the things on my list. But what about the rest? What about all the other things that I would have to do every day in order to work that kind of job that I would not enjoy doing? I was working night shifts at that time, and that was actually pretty shit, because I would wake up in the morning, or I would not wake up in the morning, I would work through the night, and I would wake up during the day and I would feel terrible, because, you know, you, you hadn't slept all night, we would go home, sleep for a few hours, and I had a lot of time to think about myself, and I did feel like a huge failure. I mean, I disappointed everyone, kind of. My parents, they had always supported me, and they just wanted me to find a nice career. My girlfriend, she just wanted me to be happy. That's all she wanted, but I wasn't. And most important, I disappointed myself. Because I'd taken all these years to figure out what I wanted to do. And I'd come up with absolutely nothing. So as I said, I was working night shifts. And one of these night shifts, I sat down. It was a lonely, dreadful night, sometime in, I don't know, it was probably in September, October. And I took a kind of different approach. Instead of thinking about jobs and career paths, I started thinking about myself and about the last few years. And I thought about the times that I had been truly happy, that I had been really, really happy. And I asked myself, why was I actually happy at those times? What did I do that made me happy? What were the things I was doing then? And I started writing all things down. And by the end of the night, I had come up with a list, a very, very personal list of the things that I enjoy doing. Oh, there are the travel pigs. This is North America. There's one travel pick. Let's see what else happens. I want to show you that list. No? We don't have a list? There's the list. That's a very personal list that I wrote that night. I still have that in my diary. Those are the five things that I enjoy doing most in the world. Number one, be traveling and explore places that will change you. Number two, be outdoors a lot and be active. You know, climb mountains and stuff. Number three, care about nature and the environment. Number four, care about people and their experiences. And number five, work towards making the world a better place. And then I did something seemingly very obvious, but I had never thought of that before. I took the keywords from that list, and I searched for them on Google. Traveling, explore, outdoor, active, nature, environment, people, experiences, and that last one I called sustainability, because that's kind of what it is. So what do you think happened when I put all of that into Google? What do you think were the results when I searched for that? It was all about tourism. It was all about the tourism industry and the challenges it was facing in a time of social and environmental crisis. Now, I mean, if you look at those words, that might not seem very surprising to you, but at the time, I was completely baffled. I had never considered myself to be making a career in tourism. Mostly,
because I had absolutely no clue what sort of tourism jobs were out there. I mean, I knew that people worked in like hotels, as I had done, or that people would work as tour guides. But I didn't know any other jobs in that field. And that's when I realized that I had done this whole thing wrong the entire time. Instead of thinking about jobs, I should have thought about myself, and I should have thought about activities. Not think about the kind of profession I wanted to have, or the sort of person that I wanted to be, but about the things that I wanted to do, the things that I was good at doing, the things that I enjoyed doing. That was quite the realization for me. I had done this whole thing wrong the entire time. And once I would realized that, I, took my, I, I turned my entire life around within a few weeks. I quit my job, stopped working at the hostel. I enrolled at a small university in, in Germany where I studied a program called Sustainable Tourism Management. And in this program, it all started coming together. I was able to learn the things that I needed to learn in order to do the things that I wanted to do. They did not prepare me for one specific job, but they gave me the skills and the experience necessary to work in a whole variety of jobs, in a whole variety of careers within the tourism sector. And <clears throat> now I'm here. I work in tourism now. And since, since, I studied, since I started studying sustainable tourism management, I've been able to try out a lot of very interesting things. I've had amazing experiences. I consult businesses now and help them to be more sustainable. I get to guide people and create amazing experiences for them and travel with them. I get to climb mountains for work and sometimes even get to share my passions for the outdoors with people when I give workshops about hiking, about guiding, about all these things. Um, there's some of my old passions are in there too. I write about places, as you can see here. I create online marketing content. I write articles, take pictures of places. So that is also in there still. And I get to travel so, so much. That's a picture of me. <laughs> it's kind of funny because now I have a clue, but anyway. <laughs> Guys, I think this is the right presentation, by the way. So why am I telling you all this? Why am I telling you my life story? It's definitely not to brag about how awesome careers in tourism are, because, I mean, that might be true for me, Many people, that's not the thing that they should be doing. I'm telling you this because I'm kind of where many of you are right now. Well, I'm not there now, but I was there 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was kind of where you are right now. And I know that many of you, I'm talking to the young people, I'm talking to the students now, I know that many of you have this vague idea that you could become doctors or lawyers, and that that would be a relatively safe career choice, because you could definitely work in that field. But is this really what makes you happy? Is this really what you want to do for the rest of your lives? There are so many careers out there, and I bet that you haven't even heard of half of them. I mean, people work in jobs now that 15 years ago didn't even exist. People couldn't even imagine those kinds of jobs. Facebook was launched in 2004. Instagram was launched in 2010. Do you think 15 years ago, anybody would have thought that just a few years later, people would be working as social media managers or online content writers? I know it's scary to think of the future, to think that soon you'll be leaving the security of home and of school and that you'll have to find your own path out there. But it's also a big fat chance to follow your own passions, to follow your own talents, to rid yourself of the expectations of people and society, at least to some extent, and to, to focus on the things that you want to do. It took me 10 years to figure that out, almost 10 years, but I'm really glad I did, because otherwise I'd be, um, I don't know, a really bad teacher right now or a really terrible lawyer with burnout syndrome. Instead, I managed to find a field, in my case, the tourism industry, where I can put most of my passions, most of my potentials, my talents, to good use for myself and for the community. So, in my infinite wisdom of someone in his late 20s, here are some things that I wish somebody would have told me 10 years ago, but nobody did, unfortunately. Don't panic. Growth needs time. Hell, it took me 10 years to figure that out. And much of it wasn't pleasant, to be honest. But I'm really glad I did. So if your friends, I mean, if you're about to graduate from high school now, if your friends suddenly seem to know exactly what they want to do, they want to go and become a doctor or a lawyer, I don't know, and you feel like you haven't figured it out, relax. 
You've got this. You've got an amazing journey ahead of you, and there's no hurry right now. Don't think of jobs, though. Think about what you want to do. I've wasted years waiting for that one perfect job description to come away that would sort of be the answer to all of my questions. I'm really sorry to disappoint, but that perfect job for you probably doesn't exist yet. Because who knows what the future will bring? 15 years ago, there were no social media managers. Who knows what sort of jobs we'll have 15 years from now? And, except, well, and instead of like following a set career path, more and more people are actually creating their own jobs these days, on their very own terms. And so can you one day. So find the things that make you happy and be passionate about them. And I can't stress that enough. Please, be passionate. We somehow accepted this idea that we need to be cool and careless at times, and it's really nerdy and dorky to care about stuff. Forget about coolness. Learn with passion. Be passionate about stuff. If you love doing something, go wild and crazy about it. Put yourself out there. And if you build something amazing, or if you achieve something great, go out there and celebrate yourself. There are way too many dull people out there. Burn with passion. Stay curious and try yourself out. Now that's the really active part. If you just sit at home and wait for good things to come your way, you will wait forever. It's not going to happen. If you're good at something, put yourself out there and see what you can do with it. You love reporting? Great. Go to your local newspaper and ask if you can freelance. You love computers? Okay. Take a beginner's class in coding and build your own app. You love food? Well, great. Um, I don't know. Make a collection of vegan recipes and they'll publish them as an ebook. It's all about experience. It's all about trial and error. And there are so many lessons that you can learn. However, don't go all in. It's OK to change. OK, let's wait a second here. I just told you to burn with passion, to go wild and crazy about the things that you're passionate about. And now I'm telling you to not go all in. Well, the thing is, you're quite young. And your passions and your interests will likely change over the next few years. And that is absolutely OK. But you need to leave room for that change. I'm sure there's more than one thing that you enjoy, that you love doing. Keep doing them. Even if you're really passionate about one thing right now, keep doing these other things as well, a little bit at least. They might all come together in the end. You'll see. And then find a field where it all comes together. Now, when you figure out what it is that you want to do, when you find out what the things are that make you happy, look where they overlap. Look where they meet. It's what I did that one dreadful night when I googled the keywords of my passions and I found out that actually I should be working in Turin, which I had never considered before. Look at those intersections, focus on these intersections, and then get trained and acquire the skills necessary to work in that field and get the skills that you need to, 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 to work in, a, in this field in many different sorts of jobs, not just in one specific kind of jobs. If you found the right thing, you'll be able to do almost anything with the skills that you've learned on the way. And if by the end of that journey, you find out that what you should do is to become a doctor or a lawyer, please go ahead and do it. Be the world's best doctor. Cure cancer, for Christ's sake. It's time someone does that. Be an awesome lawyer who changes the world for the better. But if that doesn't feel right, then keep looking, OK? It's OK to wander aimlessly for a while, as I've done for many years, and try out things and to fail. There's a lesson in every step that we take. But if you keep being passionate about the things that you love doing, if you keep that burning flame alive, then you'll find your place in that big, scary world out there. And you will maybe even change it to the better. Now, I'm not a superstar. I'm not famous. I'm pretty much just a regular guy who loves his job. And honestly, I couldn't ask for more. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Very yeah. motivational. Since we have uh, actually, I think, 20 minutes before coffee <laughs> break starts, I thought it would be nice if you agree if we just have a little chat. Yeah, sure. Right. What do you want to know? Well, um, see some more travel pictures. <laughs> don't promise anything you can't deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would like to, but uh, actually, no, I, there were several 
um, you know, when you hear a speech, you, yeah. you, you trend off and follow. You, you go on with yours, but, but the listener is following for the while with uh, their own ideas. So, of course, that would also what, what I did. What kept in my mind just at the start when you said um, when you went to high school and yeah. you, you developed uh, interest in photography and all that, I said, well, um, now he talks about this hmm, total freedom, whatever will develop in your speech. But actually, you had your time frame. Yeah. You had your schedule, and I assume you finished high school with good grades, whatever. Okay, so, but, but you didn't really mention that. That I was didn't. kind of your time frame, and you performed in it. And then you had your other life, which made you happy. Mm -hmm. But you didn't really... Please comment on, on, the, on the duty side, on your, a, you take it for granted, sort of. This is sort of a difficult position to be talking about this now, because I know that there are some teachers here, and yeah. I should probably talk some sense into young people. I might have mentioned that I was a bit of a troublemaker, and that also meant I didn't always attend school when I was supposed to attend school. <laughs> um, I think I realized pretty early in my life that the school does not always teach you the things that you want to learn. It teaches you many cool things, and I enjoyed going to school most of the time, but sometimes, let's just say, my focus was on other things, and then I would sort of neglect school duties. Actually, for more than four years in a row, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth grades, um, I don't know how that translates into the Albanian school system, but that was when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, I was really close to failing the class each year. And it was only shortly before I graduated from high school that I got my <clears throat> so-called shit together and literally started really focusing on school so that I would have good grades in the end. Now, that is not a very valuable life lesson, to be honest. Kids, focus on school. Go to school, please. I mean, <laughs> don't just stay at home and do fun things. But I feel like if you... I mean, school is the set time frame. It's this set institution where you have to go and do certain things. But at the same time, school is not all your life. You have your afternoon life as well, and even sometimes in schools, you might, in school, you might, you know, you might be asked to give a presentation about a topic, and you can just choose a topic that you care for. You might be asked to write a paper about something, or a text, or a story. Choose a topic that you're interested in. Try to focus things that you enjoy doing, and you can actually, you know, make those happen in school as well. I know that I grew up with a lot of privilege, and that many doors were open to me that are not open to everyone, but I still feel like everybody can at least you also have the afternoon hours. I mean, school ends at what? One o'clock most of the days? Yeah. What do you do with the rest of the afternoon? Focus on the things that you want to do. You know, find out what you want to do, and you can make time for those, I think. I think I have a bit similar background, uh, yeah. like you, and the attitude towards education and so on. So I'm, I think I'm very, very competent to ask you. <laughs> uh, what, if you look back on your school yeah. days, what do you think it was worthwhile? I mean, it, you, you have biology and Latin and uh, mathematics and so on. It's, of course, it's a, education is a, is, yeah. a, is a bundle of things, yeah. and, and it's part of your personality. And you cannot really say, well, those two lessons of biology were worthwhile and those six were yeah. not or so. But what, <coughs> what does the school education, if you look back on it, what, what has it brought to you? And, of course, the next question then is, what but actually, apart from yeah. motivation and so on, what advice would you have for a modern school system? <laughs> but let's first, uh, so the first question maybe. Sometimes yeah. it might seem like you go to school and you might already have an idea of what you're interested in. You say, I don't know, let's say you're really into animals, biology. You love, you know, all sorts of animals and you think they're, they're really cool. You want to learn more about kangaroos and sharks and awesome huge whales. And you feel like, okay, I really want to go to biology. Why do I have to learn French? Why do I, have to learn? I don't know. <coughs> English in school. I don't care about that. I want to learn about animals. Animals are cool. But you're not going to spend your entire life just working with animals. Even if you become a biologist, let's say you become a marine biologist, and you get to swim with dolphins and sharks, and, and you know, but what are you actually going to do? Okay, so you're going to swim with dolphins because you want to observe in their natural habitat. And then what are you going to do? You're going to write a paper about it going to publish your results. In order to publish your results, you need to write a text. In order to get this text published, you need to write a few emails, talk to people. Maybe you have to publish it internationally, so it's good to speak more than one language. 
Um, you know, you might have collect all this data about the awesome dolphins that you just swam with, but you need to sort of calculate them together, so you need maths too. And biology is actually a lot of chemistry as well, so you need chemistry as well. And then you will probably write that report on a computer, so it makes sense to know a little bit about informatics and about how to use a computer as well. So it's always more than just one topic. And I dreaded some of the topics in school, some of the subjects I hated. I, I hated going to physics class. I mean, physics was the worst. I had always terrible grades in physics because there's so much math in there, and it's like I, I never got it quite. You know, with these arrows, and then there's force that goes from one part to another. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I remember hating that. But actually, the more and more that I've, I've been, like in the last 10 years, so many times, I actually stumbled upon something where I was like, I, I know how to do this. And then I realized it's something that I learned in school and that I probably didn't enjoy learning in school. But it makes sense to, to, to get a broad education, a wide education, to learn about all sorts of things, even though sometimes it might be really, really boring. But that actually leads me to the answer of your second question. Um, I think one of the biggest problems in schools is that many times young people, and it was definitely true for me, do not see why they should learn that. It doesn't feel like they're actually going to need what they learn. Or they might feel like the things that they think they need to learn, they don't learn in schools. So I think the biggest challenge for schools is actually make it obvious to young people why they should be learning certain things, and also to listen to students and be like, hey, what do you actually want to learn? And can we make it possible to make that happen within the framework of the school? Um, because I definitely would have wanted to learn some other things that I did not learn in school, and I had to sit down at home and learn them myself. I think they would be good to be taught in school. I had no philosophy and I had no psychology in school. That would be cool to learn that. I never learned that. Um, so, so I think what the school system really needs to do is to listen, to sit down and maybe have panels with young people, you know, to change the, the, the plan of education, to, to change the content of classes, and to find out what people actually care for and what they think is going to be important for their future. Because what's the point of education if you leave school and you're not prepared for the world out there. And I think young people often actually know better than their teachers what they need to learn. Because you're much closer to the world out there. Teachers maybe have taught for 20, 30 years. They do a good job, but I mean, what they do is they teach the same stuff over and over. But you are confronted with all the issues every day. You know these challenges. And you know what you need to learn, but school doesn't really have to that. So in my opinion, school should be a lot more interactive, not just during the lessons, but in actually creating sort of the plans for education. I think we need much more participation of young people. Well, to break down uh, what you said in bullet points, I would uh, say one of the things you said, languages, yeah. communication skills, whatever yeah. it is. I would kind of add, you didn't mention it, but and indirectly you did, intercultural competence. Definitely. Travel and understand other people and cultures. Yeah, maybe change program if that is possible, you know, or at least watch some foreign films and talk about why they are different than the films that you're usually watching. And uh, one thing you did mention, but I uh, you probably agree, uh, discipline. Yeah, I could have used that <laughs> in school. I did learn that in school. And it would have made things a lot easier. Yeah. But as I said, I mean, to me, it's not only about the things that need to be taught, but actually about listening to what students want to learn and to, to participate them in those, pro like have them partake in that process, to be a part of that. Because when was the last time that you were asked what you want to learn in school? It's a serious question. When, when, when did that happen last time? Did somebody ask you, what do you want to learn in school? I, I hear a few nevers, a few first days, but I think it's not happening on a daily basis. And I understand why teachers aren't doing that, because they are under a lot of pressure too. Of I course. think this needs to start at a different level. We need political changes, we need policy changes where we participate young people, where we ask what they think is important to learn in schools. So it's important for young people also to volunteer yeah. in, uh, also in society yeah. and, and politics and so on and, and say we want to be Definitely. part in committees and yeah. uh, because what teachers teach, as you said, is what, what the uh, uh, plan, yeah. uh, what, what is required by the curriculum required by the, by the ministry. Yes, and I think what, what really is um, uh, very, very central is to learn to learn and to, nev to never stop learning. Yeah, yeah. Like if I, if I look at my education, I'm an economist, and what I learned in the economy uh, 50 years ago almost, I can, I can just put in the waste can because it's, it's not true anymore. There are two central things in economics which was 
uh, central uh, in, 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 my, in my education, and, and they don't exist anymore. And the one thing is interest rates. You know, if you know Keynes, he had uh, the theory about unemployment and interest rate. Yeah. Well, we don't have interest rates anymore. No, it doesn't exist anymore. So, yeah. away with that. And the second was the idea that uh, all people react rationally. Yeah. You know, we wear those nice models and uh, everything is transparent. Yeah. And you have ra rational, no, we know, no. People don't act rationally, no, not at all. Look at the stock market, for instance, right. you know. It's so totally irrational. positions all the time. So I spent, uh, I don't know, three and a half years studying economics, and I can yeah. not use it anymore. And, and that happens, of course, with, with many, of course, engineering and uh, a physics teacher. I, I doubt that, that a physics teacher can, can confront his class with what he has learned years ago, if you yeah. especially look in astrophysics and, sure. and all that. So, um, yeah, do we have a microphone? I think we have a microphone. Microphone here, please. So all can listen in. Could you first give your name or your position? My name is Klaus Bolka and I'm a member of Elite Travel Group. I work in the product department and I wanted to ask a question to Simon. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to ask you who's your favorite teacher in school? During, well, favorite teacher. Yeah, your favorite teacher. Oh, yeah, definitely. I remember my favorite teacher. And I'm a student also. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean in school, in high school or in university? Wherever you want. Okay. I'm going to go with university. I had this one teacher um, which she taught a class on, um, on basically gender studies. That means we would talk a lot about oppressive systems and discrimination. You know how, like, society reacts very differently to men and women. How men have lots of privileges that women don't have. Oh, they face a lot of, like women face a lot of depression, but it's not only women, it's also about sexuality. So if you happen to be homosexual or transsexual, people will not treat you the same way. They will not give you the same access to, you know, will not have a hard time finding an apartment. Also, in many countries, there's a big issue of racism, that if you have the wrong skin color, um, then you that you don't have the same access. You might not get an apartment if you want to find an apartment. You might apply for 20 jobs and you might not get the job, not because you are less qualified, but because you have the wrong skin color. And to be honest, as someone who grew up with a lot of privilege and who had never experienced any of that himself, I didn't really understand that. And then I had a teacher, and she just literally took the time to sit down with people like me, people who have had a lot of, experience, a lot of privilege in their life and who had had it very, very easy in life, and she would just literally explain it to us and show us all these examples. She would just be very, very patient with us and show us, hey, this is very problematic. Look at the numbers. If you have the wrong skin color, then you will have to apply for 47 times as many jobs as someone with a white skin. And that was just very eye-opening because she made it very, very tangible. But the thing that I remember most was that we were talking about, about activists in that field, about people who, who have experienced that sort of oppression and discrimination and, and how they had changed the world. And she gave us all these examples of great people. I mean, some of the most famous ones are, I don't know, Martin Luther King, you know, Malcolm X, um, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. And then she made us look at the, um, basically at the, uh, their life stories and what they, had, what they had done in life. And she had asked us, if you look at their life stories, what can you see? And it turned out that all of these people had sooner or later had trouble with the law. Most of them had been in jail, not just one time, many times. Some of them were kicked out of school. Many of them had been fired from jobs. And she said, there's a reason why the people who make the great changes in the world, the, grand, the, the biggest changes in the world, are not the ones who were comfortable for everyone else, who just did what everyone else was doing. She said, the people who changed the world and who are really, really big people in history, they are the ones who ask the really difficult questions who make life hard for other people, who go out there and want to change something, don't just accept everything the way it is, but who say, hey, there's something wrong here, we need to change this. And I'm not going to accept that that makes feel, people feel uncomfortable, or that people now have to change the way they think about stuff, or how they, what, how they do things. But, but they, have to, they have to accept now that change is coming. And honestly, Klaus, um, I certainly expect that from, from young people, not only in Albania, but in the entire world, to not just do what's always been done, to not just accept everything the way it is, but to ask yourself, how can I change this? What do I have to do 
And sometimes that will mean that you literally piss off people. The people will hate you for that, especially grown-ups. They don't like being questioned. They don't like it when you tell them that, you know, what you've been thinking, what you've been doing, that's not the right way to do this. And we can change something. But it's really, really necessary. So, yeah, she was very inspirational in that respect. Time for one last question, and then we go into coffee break. And it's a, it's a question where maybe you think about it for one or two seconds. Yeah. What's the difference between staying in your comfort zone and being happy? Um, this might be a drastic way to put it, but being happy is never easy. For me, happiness is not something where you say, like, yeah, it's all right. You know, I've had a hard day, now I'm on the couch, I'm watching some Netflix. That's when I feel maybe a little bit content in the moment, or I might feel a little bit of happiness. I wouldn't describe that as, like, a really happy moment of my life. If you think of the happy moments of your life, and you just try to remember, like, when was the last time that I was boring with joy? I'm pretty sure it was not Netflixing on the couch. I'm pretty sure it's when you achieved something great, when something... When something happened, and achieving something great, you know, just, just achieving something, when you've overcome a challenge, or you've, you've done something really, really difficult, and you succeeded, um, that's never easy. Because otherwise, you wouldn't feel happy. Otherwise, it would just be normal. And um, that also means that if you're going to be really, really happy, maybe before that, you felt really, really terrible. Maybe it just really, really sucked. Maybe it was a terrible day, but at the end, it was worth it because you were really happy with the result. I'm a, I'm, I mentioned a couple of times that I'm a mountain climber, and um, actually, mountain climbing is a terrible sport. It's the worst thing you can do. I mean, you know, you could stay in the valley, with a nice house, it's warm, you've got food, and you should stay there, watch some Netflix, it's cool. Or you could go up a mountain where it has minus 10 degrees, it's windy, it's stormy, you know, maybe it's snowing, and you have to really work your way up a steep slope, or maybe a glacier, it's dangerous. You could die up there. It really hurts, you know. You might, you might get injured, all this shit. But once you're at the summit, or maybe not even the summit, but just at a really beautiful spot, you, you turn around and you look around and you see the mountains and you see the landscape and you look down on the valley and you look down at the path that you came up and you, you feel this great sense of achievement. Hey, I, I just walked up there, all the way from the valley, all the way from down there. I walked up that hill to the summit and now I, I can look down on it. And I'm absolutely exhausted. But but wow, I mean, that's just such a strong feeling. And I think that's kind of what life is like many times. It's a bit simple to put it that way, but I mean, you, have to, you have to work for awesome stuff to happen. And if you, if you seem to achieve something and you don't really feel happy about it, then maybe it wasn't the right thing that you should have done, or maybe you've invested in the wrong thing. But you will notice that when you work for something and then you achieve it, you actually get to the point where you want it to get. You feel really good about it. You feel really good about yourself, and to me that is happiness. But it has nothing to do with the comfort zone. It's actually all about leaving the comfort zone. Does good. that answer your question? Oh, I think there were a wide range of possibilities. <laughs> but uh, sorry, but, uh, I, I could add the, uh, the the other way to the other sport that uh, competes with climbing is sailing. Yeah. So it's the most the most expensive way to come to travel without comfort. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but to achieve something, and I think you mentioned it in a side sentence, is sharing. Yeah. If you share, I think Robinson Crusoe had a hard time to, to be happy because he didn't have anybody to share. Yeah. Edmund Hillary, the first person to climb Mount Everest, was not alone on the yeah. Mount Everest. He had a Sherpa with him, and they were really, really close friends. Right. And, but nobody talks about that, but he didn't do that alone. He had a lot of help. Good. Okay, so I'm sure a coffee break will not give us uh, happiness, but maybe some comfort. <laughs> and uh, we see each well, other... Well, hard for this coffee break. Don't forget that. <laughs> 4.15, we continue with the program. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.